We're going to pick up in Joshua 6 because that's where we left off like in maybe May or sometime. And so whenever it was, the last time I preached on Joshua, I don't know. But find Joshua 6. This is our Walls of Jericho passage, um, the uh, account of the walls falling down. And so just to jump back in where we were, the Israelites had just crossed um, the Jordan River in flood stage where the priest uh, went in and they built, even in the middle of the Jordan, a, a monument to remember that this is where God uh, basically tore the, put the waters up in a heap on one side and let them run down and the whole Israel crossed um, into the land. They had also had a kind of a re-covenant ceremony um, where they had uh, gotten out the flint knives and we won't go any further than that. Um, but uh, today we're looking at at Joshua 6. And so if you found that, I'm going to read the first 21 verses And we're going to preach a message this morning called A Strange Way to Deal with Obstacles Um, because this is the first city that we've come to. Um, The the city of Jericho would be the the prototype of sorts for the remainder of the the conquest. And that's what had to happen um, is as this this part of, of Joshua starts, the giving of the land, all these other groups had to be pushed out. Um, and so that's really where we're going today is the beginning of that. And over and over in Scripture, the battle here at Jericho was used as an example um, as they took city after city after city. Uh, and the important part is that what we're going to see today is God gets the glory because God does the fighting and God gets the spoils, the glory, everything. So let's look real quick. Joshua chapter 6 verses 1 through 21. Uh, you read along as I read aloud. And uh, we'll pick up in verse 1, Joshua chapter 6. It says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand and its king and mighty men of valor. And you shall march around the city, all the men of war, going around the city once. And thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast from the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets, ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had been commanded I had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the Lord went, or, yeah, before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets, and with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. And the armed men were walking about, or before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark, while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, "You shall not shout." Or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day that I tell you. And then you shall shout. So he he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. And then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually, and the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking uh, after the ark of the Lord while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city uh, once and returned to camp, and so they did for six days. And on the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. 
It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at that seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, and Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. And only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you... Keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and every vessel of bronze or iron are holy to the Lord, and they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown, And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up uh, into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. And then they devoted all the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, that we can trust it, that it is holy, that it came from you, that it is inspiration, inspired by you, and that it speaks today even to us. And we pray that you would anoint this congregation, that it may hear, uh, not from me, Lord, but from you, from the words that are spoken today, that you would give them just the anointing of the Holy Spirit to hear. God, I pray that you would anoint me as well to preach that your word may go forth in power, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be pleasing in your sight, Lord, your sight alone. My Lord, my God, my Redeemer, and we pray these things in Christ's name, and amen. How many of you know how to play chess? Okay, just wanted to see how many this illustration is going to fall completely flat on. Um, Think about chess for just a moment. The, the quick version is there's eight rows and eight columns of squares. And you get 16 pieces, uh, eight pawns across the top, and then all the important pieces in the back, the knights and the, the, the rooks or the castles and uh, the bishops. And all these uh, queen and the king are all in the back row. And, and I want you to think of yourself as one of the pawns. Now, many of you get that part of the illustration because we talk about the pawns of life, P-A-W-N-S, and in case you don't get my, my accent, but think about yourself as one of the pawns, okay, out there in the front, um, and, and basically the battle is overwhelming, you know, if you, most chess sets, the pawns are really short compared to the bishops and the kings and, and, and the, the queens and, and all that. And so you can't see the battle in its fullness, in its complexity. And pawns, they can only move, except for the first move, they can only move one square at a time. If you're a pawn, you can't take a piece straight on. You have to go to the side, to the corner. You can diagonally take a piece, but you can't take one straight on. But, but you're kind of a sitting duck out there. You're the front row. You're where all the, the bullets go at the first the first shot, so to speak, and you feel insignificant, powerless, you know, uh, a little confused. But now, put it in perspective. When all those little pieces are out there, the pieces don't see the little grandmaster chest, chess player, except for when he grabs them by the top of the head and moves them a little piece, and then he's gone again. Because they're small, they're short, they're tiny, right in on the board, and then another grandmaster may pick up a piece and move it. And, and the grand chess master knows the game. He's watching it all. He's seeing the complexities. He's seeing the bishops over here and the ones over there, and he's seeing the knight and how it moves. And, and he's, he's the one up there that's anticipating every move. He's the one that's up there thinking about the crucial role that the pawn has in the greater strategy. And so if you're a pawn, you may not think you can do much. You may not understand the battle that's going on much. But there's somebody up there, the great chess master, who is 
doing what he does. And the victory of the game doesn't rely on the pawn's contribution necessarily. It relies on the skill of the grandmaster. One of the things that we're going to see today, in fact, the thing that I want you to see today is that much like the, the battles that we face in life, we may feel like little pawns, but we know that there is a grand chess master up there who anticipates and knows every single move, who has a, a battle plan for us, as strange or odd as it may seem. Because in the text today, one of the things that you see is it's pretty strange instructions for taking a city. And I don't know that it's legitimate to apply this to all of our struggles and problems in life. I don't think that's necessarily what the text was intended to do, but I think it's definitely an application. So that's where we're going we're to camp out today and talk about the truths that are found in this passage where the grand chess master is making his moves and what our parts are as pawns and his parts are as the chess master. So four things. Number one is that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Notice that what God says in chapter 6 verse 2. It says, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. So God speaks in the past tense. Did you notice that? He said, I have given this, this idea of already. I, I've given you the city even though you're still standing out here. And you realize they're coming into a land, this, this group of Israelites, and they're taking these cities these cities that are fortified, big walls, ramparts. I saw several, um, I saw several reconstructions and, and illustrations of Jericho and what it looked like and how they had an interior wall and an exterior wall and a rampart in between and, and all these things. And you got this, this people, the children of Israel, they had no cities, they had no defenses. They didn't have a place where they were keeping a bunch of, uh, a cache of weapons. You know, I mean, they had weapons. It's not like they didn't have any, but they couldn't go into the, the heart of the fortified city and get weapons when they ran out. When the horses or the chariots, you know, were, were broken or, or they died or whatever, there was no stash of those back in the camp. They had sheep and some oxen. But there was no place for them to run to and hide. And so they're looking at this city and they're saying, you know, how are we going to take this city? The walls are huge. The people, I mean, who knows how big the army is in there? And so that's the kind of a, a nomadic people that's going up against a fortified city. And they want to know, how do we do this? But God says this, I have given you the city. Past tense, I've given you the city. It's in your hands already. Even though, you know, we may not have understood how that was going to work. Joshua may not have understood how that was going to work. But that was the first word that happened in this passage. God speaking to Joshua saying, I've given you the city. Why? Because the battle is the Lord's. He, he, he says, Joshua, I've given it to you already. All you have to do is do what I say. It's my battle. I've won it. You know, I, I own it all, and I've won this battle already. I think back to, to battles and, and things that, that were overcome in Scripture like David and how that when he came to face Goliath, uh, you know, he, he came out there, and Goliath laughed at him and said, you know, you send me a dog. You know, how, how, are you, how, how do you think that this is going to end well for David? Goliath taunted the people of Israel, taunted the God of Israel, right? And David looks out at him, he said, look, you come to me today with a spear and a sword and a javelin. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. He said, that's, that's what's going to happen right here today. In fact, what he says, he, he continues on. He said, I'm going to strike you down. And I'm going to give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds and the wild beasts of the earth so that all may know that there is a God in Israel. 
And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. And that's what, that's what, and, and if you read the rest of the passage there with David and Goliath, he runs at Goliath with his little five stones. He's running, stone in hand, slinging, running at the, at the giant with the sword and the spear and the shield. And he's running. He says, I'm going to cut your head off today and feed your body to the birds. Why? Because I'm 16 years old. I'm a little kid. You're a giant, a man of war and battle. But he said, the battle's not mine. He said, the battle's the Lord's. God's going to take care of this. All I have to do is walk in faith. God is going to take care of this. In our battles, we need to remember passages like, Romans chapter 8, verse 8, it says that all things work together for good, right? For God's good, for His glory. It says for all those that, uh, it says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Now, notice it says for good, not for your good. Remember that when you quote Romans chapter 8, verse 28, okay? It's for good, for God's good, for his good, not necessarily for your good. But we do know later in the same chapter, in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, it says, He who did not spare his only son for us, how shall he not now graciously give us all things? And so we're given an example of what God will do for us in the fact that he gave us his son already. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4, I think that really illustrates this point very well. He says, every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be made low. Even the uneven ground will become level, and the rough places become a plain. God says, this is what I'm going to do for Israel. I'm going to flatten the mountains. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smooth out the rocky roads. That doesn't mean that life will be easy, but that means I have the power to take care of any obstacle in your way. Any obstacle. Every city in your life that is to be conquered, every, every challenge that you face, every, every heartbreak, everything that you're going through right now is conquered by the Lord. You, you don't have to, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You don't have to, you know, grit your teeth and work harder. This is the battle of the Lord's. And so we remind ourselves of the questions that the Lord orchestrates all things in our life for good, that He has all power, all wisdom, that every good gift comes from God, right? He said, in fact, he does everything that he wants in Psalm 135, verse 6. Everything. The Lord does exactly what he wants. St. Patrick uh, of, of Ireland was born in Scotland. He was taken captive by the, the Irish raiders, and he spent years as a slave in Ireland. And then he came back, he got set free, went back to Scotland, but then he decided the Lord was calling him to go back to his captors to Ireland and be a gospel witness because they were pagans. And so he goes back and he spends the rest of his life starting churches in Ireland. That's why we call him St. Patrick of Ireland, even though he was really from Scotland. But he said this he, in, in one of his famous prayers, third century, I'm sorry, fourth century, he speaks about Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, and Christ when I sit down. Those, this is how he viewed his life when he's trying to start churches among pagan people that were formerly his captives. They weren't friendly to his cause. But every battle that we face, we know the Lord is with us. And I feel like that a lot of times we need to build up our minds with a robust theology of who God is. 
I mean, without this, we're, we, we lose track and we forget about his abilities and his character, who he is and what he's done. We lack peace. We lack comfort. There's a little book that I would recommend to you um, written by A.W. Tozer. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. Um, probably some of you have read it. It's a, it's a short little book, and it talks about who God is. Um, it's a great book. If you haven't read it, Tozer was a pastor in the 1950s in Chicago at Moody Bible Church. You've got to get that book. So write down Knowledge of the Holy. That's what it's called, A.W. Tozer. Tozer was a, a, a brilliant pastor. He was a thoughtful pastor. It's, it's a short read, but it's not an easy read because it talks about the complexities of who God is. If we build ourselves up, though, with that, okay, with the understanding of who God really is and all his power, then when doubt comes, when, when struggle comes, these, this theology that we believe is our rock, it's our foundation. We sing it, we preach it, we have to preach it to ourselves very often. You ever have to do that? You're going down the road of doubt in your mind. You're going down the road of, uh, of, of wondering, is God really here? Is God really, really going to do this? You know, Satan does that in our minds sometimes, and the enemy leads us and says, really, God hasn't done this, or he's not going to do this, or he's not this kind of God. He's forsaken you. God's not in this. And we fall into that trap in our life. Instead of saying, God is a God who does exactly what he pleases. And every good gift comes from the Lord. And he is kind and he is good and he is merciful. We read a scripture this morning in uh, Sunday school that talked about how that we understand, we boast in the fact that we know and understand God because he's a God of righteousness, he's a God of justice, and he's a God of tender mercies, loving kindness, faithfulness. He said, that's the kind of God that you serve. And that's what we need to build ourselves up in. Because sometimes the, the battle goes like we think it's going to go, and then sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't go the way that we think it should go, we have to remind ourselves that God's got this, and this is his battle. Number two, the faith is the people. So the battle is the Lord's, the faith is the people's. Look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the, un the armed men pass before the ark of the Lord. So God just told them, This is what I'm going to have you do. You're about to take this city. This fortified, double-walled city with lots of people, with a king, with men of valor, with armies. And you're going to do this. You're going to go up to that city. You're going to get in an order that I tell you to get in. You're going to have some, your army. You're going to have the priests. This is kind of an odd formation for battle, right? But you're going to have these folks, and they're going to march around the city. One time a day for six days, okay? This is your battle strategy, okay? PT or whatever it was. They're just walking around the city. And on the last day, you're going to walk around the city seven times. And then at the end of seven times, there's going to be a long trumpet blast. Everybody shout, and the walls are going to fall. Okay, Joshua, good plan. You know, I, I've seen this work. It's in all the, the war strategy books. I mean, this is a great, puts us at a great tactical advantage. Of course, we're not looking for tactical advantages, right? Because we have the Lord. That's what we have. And so God gives Joshua these instructions that surely brought doubt in people's minds. I mean, can you think about the children of Israel when they're told this? These, these warriors, these armies, and even the people. You're sending my husband out there to walk around the, the city six days, and then you're going to go seven days, and the walls are going to fall. I mean, Joshua, are you sure you heard right? I mean, you sure, just maybe you didn't sleep good one night, and you thought you heard, or the wine that you drank was maybe. Are you sure you heard right? But the people's job was 
to believe. Because what did they do? They went out there and picked up the Ark of the Covenant. They went and lined up and they started marching. That's because their job was to trust God. God said, do this. And they said, okay, God, this is what we're going to do. You know, if we look to the New Testament, we see Jesus. And he's got these disciples that are with him, you know, for three years. They see all these miracles. And yet, constantly, in fact, five, well, six, just in the book of Matthew, there's five times where Jesus looks at them personally, not just people in general, but personally, and calls them ye of little faith. Just in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, 8, verse 26, this is when they were in the sea, um, and there was a storm, and Jesus was asleep on the back of the boat. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. Okay, again, disciples, Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Matthew chapter 14, this is when Peter's on the water, which was a pretty, that's a pretty big thing to do. He said, Jesus, if that's really you, tell me to come out there and I'll come. Jesus said, hey, it's me, come on. And so, you know, that, that's a plus for him. But he started to sink out there. And, and Jesus said, when he reached out his hands there in, in chapter 14, verse 31, he took hold of him and he said this, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In Matthew 16, verse 8, Jesus was aware of this. They were having a conversation. He said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that there's no bread? They didn't have any. He, he, said, he said, little faith. And again, you see, we're moving up in Matthew, moving up in Matthew, up to 17. He's talking about... Uh, how they, were, they were praying for people and trying to cast out demons because they had that power, and they couldn't. So they came back to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, there's some of these demons that won't come out. What's the deal? <laughs> Jesus tells them in 17, verse 20, he says this, because of your little faith. I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. And every one of these criticisms or every one of these instructions dealt with having faith. I had Robin read to you this morning from uh, Hebrews chapter 11 because it was about faith. whole chapter in Hebrews 11, by faith, this God did this, and by faith, this God did this. And, and a lot of the chapter is about Abraham and, and Moses and, and different ones. You get to that passage we read today. And he says, time fails me to tell of David and Samson and Jephthah and, and all these people that did this and they, 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 they conquered the kingdoms and they shut the mouths of lions, they quenched the fire, they took over, uh, or they dodged the edge of the sword and then there was people that, that got their children back, resurrected, then there was people who didn't. And he said, yet by faith, they were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. By faith. Our job is to believe. Not to, not to be a scary. This is this is just me. Okay, when things go sideways in my life, I tend to be a, a schemer. That's the way I talk about myself. Again, like Jacob. You know, Jacob was a, uh, his name means one that, that grasped the heel or the, the, the deceiver. And so I tend to be a schemer. If things go wrong in my life, I start looking at the resources that I have access to and trying to figure out how I can fix the problem on my own. Now, I was talking to somebody a few, a couple of months back and about a problem that I have and, and, and trying to figure out a way to fix that problem. And he said, you need to repent of your doubt. Like, okay. Thank you, church member, for being all spiritual on me, you know. I like practical things. Tell me what to do. I want, I want the, the scheme. I want the plan. He said, repent of your doubt. Hmm. There was a, uh, a couple, um, the Moffats, 1820, they went uh, with the Mission Society to South Africa, and then they moved up to Botswana. And 
They had 10 years of absolute, well, we may call it failure, but it wasn't failure. It was just they had no converts, didn't plant a church, didn't do those things. And the mission society was talking to them about possibly going somewhere else, okay? Seems like the work's unfruitful there. It seems like there's a wall, just difficult. And they just couldn't really, they couldn't really bring themselves to leave yet. They would poured so much and they just felt like it was near and somebody wrote them. Uh, a letter, and they asked him, they said, you know, we want to send you a gift. What is it that you need? And trusting that the Lord was working, she said this. She replied to the answer, what kind of gift? She said, send us a communion set. I'm sure it will soon be needed. She believed that God was going to save people start a church, and that they would have a communion set so that they would have communion with the believers. Now, I'm not sure how true the rest of this was, but they said that the day the communion set actually arrived, of course, this is again 1830s by that point, that they had their first communion with four believers the day the communion set got there. It could be spot on. But there was multiple sources that talked about the rest of the testimony. They believed that God was going to save people. And they believed that they should ask for a communion set. They had, they had relational faith. This is not saving faith, although if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you need saving faith. You need to put your trust in him to save you because he died on a cross. He rose again to pay your sin. And so we put our faith in that for our hope of salvation. But this was saving, this is not saving faith, relational faith. This was believing what God said and trusting in it. Because we don't force God's hand. It's not like we make him do what we want him to do because we believe, but he draws us in. We don't force his hand. He gives us instructions, and we believe and join him in what he's doing. God leads us through his word, his spirit, his church, and he will keep his promises. So do you believe that he will keep his promises? And I, I think that all of us know the, the good church answer, right? We should all say yes now. Do you believe? But the question is, do you really believe? Do you really believe that God will keep his promises? Let me ask you a question. When you operate within a ministry here at this church, or a parachurch ministry outside the, the walls of this church, so to speak, on that ministry team, are you the one that's looking back and said, well, this is what God's done so we can just believe it. This is what he's going to do and no further. Are you one that looks by faith and says, all right, what can we do? What's God going to do instead of what God has already done? When you speak to others, are your, are your words founded in human hope only, or are they founded in the confidence that God gives on biblical hope? When obstacles come to your life, do you hit the floor first and say, God, what do you have for me in this? What do you want from me now? Or are you like me? Are you a schemer? Do you start calculating Start figuring. One of the things that, you know, last week we talked about refocus and this process that we're going to begin to walk through to help us examine where we're at and where we need to go. And um, this is a process that's by faith. I don't know, I don't know if I said it enough last week, but I want to reiterate it's a process about loving Christ. It's a process about refocusing your ideas, about making disciples. It's, it's a process that's by faith. Every part of it that we do, every part of the process we do, it's by faith. It's trusting the Lord. Not trusting in ourselves. It's not trusting in a, a plan. It's not trusting in a process. It's trusting in the Lord. And this is a gift given to the church that may help us to focus better on him. 
when you get into routines and ruts and things in your life, sometimes you need God to shake a little bit and say, hey, let's, let's focus back on our life. All right, so here's what we're going to do. There's no way in the world I'm going to get through two more points. So we're going to save them for next week. And I'll tell you what they are so you can be thinking. The battle is the Lord's, and the faith is the people, the obedience is the people, and the spoils are the Lord's. So there's the outline. We'll get to those other two because I don't want to rest through them. We could rest through them and just butcher them. That's not good. The Word of God is important, and we need to not breeze over it. So I don't want to butcher it. I want to, I want to take this, and, and we'll just wait till next week. But as I thought about, about closing up, I found a story that was pretty neat. Very similar. It's almost like this, this text just re Re, uh, redone, but uh, it was a story about a village that was at the base of a, a huge mountain. You know, uh, I, I don't mean like a, a little tiny like pine mountain. I mean like Mount Everest. Okay, so they got this Mount Everest, a little village at the bottom. The tradition had always been in the village that at the top of that mountain was a stream of water that would give the the village constant water source, clean, clear. It wasn't like a fountain of youth that Coronado was looking for, but it was, it was more along the lines of, of a place that would provide for the town. Year after year, generation after generation, people from the town had tried to climb the mountain to figure out where it was and how to help the village. And year after year, they had been thwarted. Some had come back defeated. Some hadn't come back at all. So one year there was a, a little boy. He was a, a child of one of the town's um, uh, families. And he had heard the, the stories down through the years of what was at the top of the mountain and what everybody had tried to do and to get there. And he began to pray. He began to walk around the base of the mountain and pray. And the town kind of laughed. And the town looked at him as the things he was doing was, was ridiculous. He didn't go and get the latest climbing gear. He didn't go and get the maps and talk to the experts. He didn't bring chalk like those Olympic wall climbers. Did y'all see that during the Olympics? That was amazing. He just prayed. And one day, the mountain trembled a little bit. It didn't fall flat, but up the side of the mountain, there opened up almost like a, almost like a set of, of steps. Uh, it was a trail that was obvious, even from the bottom of the mountain. The boy began to just walk up this trail, and it, was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like a, a highway, a road with a, you know foiler on it or golf cart or whatever it was. He had to hike, but he got there. He brought all this water down, this, this living water, if you will, to the village and, and uh, allowed them to have all that. And the boy had just a, a thankful heart because he knew that what he did, he didn't do on his own. He prayed and asked God to move. How many times in our life do we have those mountains, those things that are in the way, those things that come up that, that do throw us for a loop and we feel like we can't get there? We feel like we try and we try. It's something that we, we want to beat and we can't quite beat. How many times do we find ourselves in that position and we either fall in despair or we try to get there on our own? We try to push our way through in our own strength. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God says, approach the throne with boldness and make your request known. Jesus says, you have not because you ask not. He says, ask and it will be given. Knock and it shall be opened. Seek and you shall find. God is a God who wants 
you to prosper in your life. And don't hear me saying financial wealth or ease and bed of roses. God wants you even to suffer well when you suffer. And in that prosper. And so the question today as we look at Joshua for you and me is do we trust that the Lord's work is the battle and that our work is to believe? How about you? The things that you're facing in life right now, do you trust in a big, good, and wise grandmaster of this world to move you where you need to be? Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, You are exalted, you are lifted up, you are worthy of all our praise. You're a God of comfort, you're a God of peace, you're a God who knows no temptation, who knows no boundaries, who knows every decision in a a right way that you never have to question yourself, never make mistakes. And Lord, when you give us the oddest instructions... Help us to follow you. Help us to believe that the battle is, is, is yours. And then we'll follow in the path that you have for us, not going to the right or to the left. And I pray that this morning in Jesus' name.